Good afternoon. Uh, this is Matt Heyman. I'm here with Dr. Rob Cook and Pastor Justin from here at Dexter Lake Church. Um, we are continuing a series on mental health uh, while we go through the COVID-19 um, process. I think we're now in week three of the stay-at-home order. Just got word from the governor today. Uh, announcement came through that it's extended to April 30th. Um, so we're going to continue um, this live broadcast on Thursdays at 6 o'clock, uh, talking about issues regarding both mental health, but as it relates to last week, we talked about um, just what it means to go through a process like this uh, from a mental health perspective. Today, we're going to be talking about children and teens, how to um, communicate with them while we all go through this. So as people are getting this, um, on their live feed and starting to tune in, I thought we would just take a moment to um, maybe reintroduce ourselves. And um, if you didn't catch our video from last week, it's on the Dexter Lake Church Facebook page. And you can go back and you can view that again. And, um, and of course, some of you who are watching this are coming after we aired this. And so um, if you do make comments, during this live portion, Pastor Justin's going to be able to see that. He'll be able to get your questions. If you, if you do have a question, we can try to answer those for you. Um, so, Dr. Rob Cook, uh, why don't you, again, just share a little bit with us about your background um, in mental health and, and specifically dealing with crises like this and family. And family. Well, my area of interest or expertise is in marriage and family. Okay. Um, I started uh, in inner city Minneapolis and then inner city Detroit, both of which are trauma laden, um, particularly Detroit. So I have background in trauma and training and I hold a master's in counseling psych and a doctorate in counseling. Okay. Excellent. All right. And you've been here in, um, at, uh, in Richland, Michigan at the Response Care Center for 14 years. Yes, yeah, I'm the director of the Response Care Center and I've been there for 14 years. Okay, very good, yeah, a wonderful resource to our community, yeah. um, subsidized by Grace Spring Church in Richland. And others. And, and many others, yeah. so um, happy to be partnering with Rob in that. Pastor Justin, you're here, um, your student ministries pastor here at Dexter Lake, and so you're navigating through this with everybody else, finding creative ways to connect with your students. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a youth pastor since 2012. Uh, 2017, I started here, um, but before that I worked with teenagers uh, in a youth group setting as well as a volunteer for five or six years before that. Um, so just constantly trying to minister to them, um, never really foresaw something like this. Um, yeah. And, and how it's and how they're handling it. Um, my kids seem to be handling it pretty good, but we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you're joining us uh, live, if, if this is coming on your, your feed, uh, welcome. We're gonna be talking tonight about COVID-19 and parenting. Um, how to talk to your kids, uh, both school-age kids, middle school, high school. A lot of dramatic things have happened, and we wanna try to help bring some perspective on, on how to do that in, a, in an effective way. So let's start with this opening thought. Um, this is really the first time that families with children and teens have experienced such a significant disruption to quote unquote normal life. Um, so first question is, what does this mean for a family unit as they navigate through this kind of a crisis? It means that the family has to have uh, some flexibility. It's going to have to have patience and they're going to uh, have to be aware of how their children and teens are processing the information that they're receiving from media sources, whether it's news at 10 or 11 or the social media. And so I think from a family perspective, the, the flexibility, the patience, and the awareness is going to be really critical for the, for the families to get through this. Mm -hmm. This is unique because this is happening to everybody at the same time throughout our homes and throughout culture. So everybody's having to kind of assess their own state of mind and their perspective at the same time having responsibility in this case to parent well. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned last week this idea of, and remind us, the, the brain, the, um, the trauma brain or the... The trauma brain versus the learning brain. Yeah. The trauma brain does not have room for learning. It's too busy surviving. Where the learning brain has, it's an openness, it sees the 30,000 foot view, um, there's flexibility, and a critical point or a critical distinction is the way the learning brain and the trauma brain process stress. Mm -hmm. The stress of a trauma brain is purely about survival. Mm -hmm. The learning brain mitigates that stress and utilizes stress for learning. Mm -hmm. It's a different feel for, it's a different feel completely. Yeah. And so when, when, so Pastor Justin, when we talk about um, maybe what you started to see with some of your interactions in the community, specifically maybe in your student group, um, how are your kids responding right now? They seem to be handling it pretty well. Good. Um, I, we've had several Zoom calls and re that have replaced our regular youth group time and youth group meetings. So we get together in these conference calls and talk. Um, and what's funny is I feel like they are so, they always have technology in front of them already. Mm -hmm. So just communicating through that medium has mm -hmm. become a, just a very natural thing for them. Oh, yeah. um, so that, I mean, these classes almost, they're, they're almost more communicative during these Zoom meetings than yeah. they would be during a normal class. Um, so that's been really good. We've been talking about fear and anxiety a little bit. And, um, you know, the, 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 the class that we did that was kind of, uh, they were like, oh, we're fine. You know, so there, there wasn't really a lot of, a lot to talk about because they didn't, they, did, they seemed to be doing all right. And I said, well, you know, what do you guys, feel, how do you feel about the news, the politics of it all, everything coming at you at once? And, and they say, well, we don't really see a lot of it. Um, they, haven't, they haven't been, and I, I think part of that is, is students don't use Facebook as much anymore. They use different things, TikTok, Instagram, um, all of those kinds of things. And you don't really see a lot of news type stuff going, mm -hmm. coming through it. Um, so they don't see it quite as much. Um, I had one student say, you know, I was doing this sport, this sport, this activity, this and that. Um, and I was stressed and uh, now I'm not because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm at home and things, have, things are, feel a little bit better. So for some of them, it's even um, a kind of a, a relief in a way from some of the stresses of school life. Um, I think there's a little bit of uneasiness there because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know, and especially with seniors, seniors are upset. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, seniors are pretty mad. I have, there's a couple seniors um, that I have that have expressed that um, my niece is a senior right now, and so they're all missing out on prom, the last few months of school, graduation, and everything. So they're, they're having to deal with that. Um, but my younger high school students all seem to be doing pretty well. Yeah, this idea of using this um, brain, this learning brain, I wouldn't think that a lot of people have a working knowledge that, oh, I'm in my working brain versus like my survival brain. No. You know, and so when, when we experience something like this and now being some three weeks into this, there is this desire, this appetite to get information, to kind of know where I'm at, to feel safe. Yeah, and at the same time, there's a cumulative effect. There's a cumulative effect about the information, the stress, or the fear. To Pastor Justin's point, you also have people responding differently to the same situation. And it's interesting, your point, because one of the things that we were seeing prior to the COVID-19 is this pressure to perform, to be involved in everything, and to do it really well. And it's not always very realistic. In fact, it's our culture is actually rather idealistic. And so they're moving and they're moving and they're moving. This has brought the world to a stop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't surprise me that some of your students would be actually taking a breath. Mm -hmm. And the, the stress and the pressure has changed. To your point, we're not generally aware of it because it's like breathing. We're, right. we're not thinking about those things. Right. Um, we're going to be talking, again, if you're joining us, you've just kind of come across this, uh, this live uh, Facebook posting. Um, you can see that we're talking about COVID-19 and parenting. 
Um, we're, we're now gonna spend until about 6.30, we're gonna spend a little bit of time now talking about as this unfolds, um, as we learned last week that schools, to what Pastor Justin shared, they won't be returning. How do parents and or caregivers, because sometimes we have parents and sometimes we have grandparents or others that are caring for the children and the teens who are adjusting this new reality. What are we sensing is going to be the biggest issue for parents to be aware of as these um, realities are being faced with new learning objectives, um, like we just talked about having new information unfolding every day, lots of information. How do parents and caregivers position themselves to communicate with their kids? I think they have to pay attention to the age and the stage of the kid or the student. Okay. And you tailor the information to their appropriate age and development and don't confuse chronological age with maturity. You know, we sometimes say in our culture, a young 15 year old or an old 15 year old, you want to, you want to, as a parent, use your assessment capabilities of your child and tailor that. And the younger the child is, the, they will lack a vocabulary. They, they won't, they won't be able to interpret or have a vocabulary to interpret what's going around them. So if you're dealing with young children, you need to be aware that their communication pattern is going to be through behavior. Could be regression, it could be anger, it could mm -hmm. be a number of things. And so as parents, recognizing and being aware of your context and creating a wide space for your kid, you, you, you're not allowing... You're not allowing them to be inappropriate, but you want them you want them to express and partner with you in the expression and, and the communication of what they're what's going on and how they're feeling. So a distinction that's important is I want to hear what they have to say versus telling them how they're feeling. Okay, I think that's a huge distinction. Say that again. I want to hear what they're saying. Yeah. I want to ask them for feedback and for information so I can, I can become a, a learner, right? I can see it through their eyes as opposed to telling them how they're supposed to be feeling during mm -hmm. the situation mm -hmm. or parenting from an attitude of inconvenience mm -hmm. that just generates anger in the parent, right? Parenting is challenging, it's not always convenient, it's particularly difficult during time of crisis. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bit of a learning curve too. I mean, oh, my, totally. My wife just uh, commented and she had said that, you know, our schools right now are still coming up with the plan for, for going forward. They're finalizing what's going on. So they, they gave us packets and things to do in the first three weeks, but now that it's gotten extended, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to figure that out. So there's a learning curve for them trying to figure out how to, you know, get parents to homeschool kids. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then yeah. for the for the parents as well who don't have that information, um, I like what you said about, you know, the different ages. I have a five and a seven year old. Yeah. My five year old, she doesn't really get what's going on. She knows, we've told her, but um, you know, she just she just knows that she can't go to school or can't see her best friends. Our son, however, when we told him that the school year was going to be done for the rest of the year, he was pretty upset because he likes going to school and was yeah. upset that he couldn't go. Um, and, she, and she has definitely been exhibiting more behavioral signs of uh, um, yeah. a disruption in her routine and schedule. Hmm? Yeah, you're pointing out, you're giving your, you're giving your kids permission to grieve. Generally speaking, abstract reasoning kicks in about eight, nine, or ten, younger for, or sooner for girls than boys, typically. But the focus is to, to have an understanding of how your child's temperament is, or character, and giving them that permission to, to hurt, to be sad. Because it's a big deal. Losing your school pals yeah. and hopes and dreams. So it's not just the loss of school, it's the hopes, the dreams, the connectedness of their friends. There's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's again, because everybody's in this together at the yep. same time. We have parents who have now been displaced from the workplace to home, 
They're expected to continue working remotely. They're getting their video system up and running yep. or whatever technology they have. They have kids in the background. Um, you have both parents sometimes both working. Speak to this for a moment. The disruption in the family unit, as this is going to continue going on for the next four weeks, and then even beyond, just trying to, to do this, how do parents navigate their own issues while at the same time trying to manage a home balance and a routine? As this continues on, we're preparing for this next four weeks. They're gonna to have to focus on good decisions. You can't do everything. And so to, to, to step back and take a deep breath and try to prioritize, prioritize what is the most critical and then set down perfectionistic standards. It's, it's, it's a realistic standard that you have to look at. You guys are a good template for this. You have working from home for you. You've got your career going, um, you know, and the crisis is going to double or triple the work output for most adults. And it, to your point, it's going to take a learning curve. So giving yourself and your kids grace, understanding that patience has to rule, giving a, a, a wide path for emotionality and the expression of emotions appropriately, and to understand that I don't have to get this all accomplished yesterday. Yeah, giving you as a parent or a caregiver, somebody responsible for kids or teens, give yourself the opportunity to breathe. Yes, um, to learn. Try to learn, stay, yeah, use your learning brain. Continue to be patient with yourself, be kind. To yourself yeah. you are who you are you have a great ability a resilience to be able to lead well and to be able to accommodate the change and uh, you're doing this along with a lot of other parents but we do need to be careful with our own emotions as adults right because you can catch the crisis right if mom and dad are having difficulties with their own emotions the kids are going to catch on to that aren't they yeah they will catch the panic the other thing too is to be honest with your kids about don't don't overload them but to be honest with your struggles and challenges that you're modeling good decision making you're modeling appropriate emotional responses and you're given permission so as i'm modeling that i can read my kids into the fact that you know what mom or dad is struggling too it's okay it's it, or it may not be okay now but it will be and so that stability and that certainty and that appropriateness and response that's critical because the kids will catch your panic they will follow your lead mm -hmm. yeah, to your point what you said about your kids you're seeing some reaction mm -hmm. out of your kids more so one versus the other yeah, yeah. And, and and my daughter is more like um, she's just social butterfly so the fact that she's got to stay at home is mm -hmm. tough she misses being at church she misses being at school seeing her friends things like that and that's but that's how she processes mm -hmm. the whole thing she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't totally understand she'll say oh can we go see my friend and my and my wife will say why can't we go see your friend <laughs> yeah that's good <laughs> you know so um yeah. we're still trying to get her to process it our son is is getting it and he's disappointed and sad but he's He's handling it and processing it pretty well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've tried to do our best to keep them on a routine. That's um, smart. We have a schedule for the, right now they're on spring break, so they're not following it. Um, but they, um, when they were doing their schoolwork and next week they're gonna pick right back up, they, they had a schedule and they helped my wife write the schedule. Mm -hmm. They picked out some of the things, where the things go on the schedule. Um, and my son, I think the, the schedule started at, at, at 8 o'clock with wake up. He wanted his own alarm set. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, set his alarm, woke up in time, and, uh, and, and moved move to you know, getting ready and all that stuff. And so he, he was taking the, the schedule pretty seriously. Um, and that seemed to work really well for them. And when there were never days when we couldn't follow the schedule for whatever reason, it uh, threw things off. Yeah, yeah. 
a lot of adjustment. Yeah. It, it makes me think of we, by nature, want to have some sense of security and control. Totally. And so when, when what we found as something that we felt in control, our schedules, our routine, when that's taken away, I think you bring up a great idea of making sure routine is part of the family unit. Um, that way everybody has a say. Everybody has a voice in this. I think that's important. I think of it as a flexible routine. It, this is an opportunity to help your family deal with a challenge that um, has not been seen before. And so the advantage is, is if the family can respond in a healthy manner now, moving forward, we're, we have an opportunity to equip our children and ourselves to deal with something like this in such a way that we can grow and learn and evolve or change through it. Yeah. And I like, I like what, you, what you guys did with in giving those kids voice, a feeling of, of control or power over the things that they can have some influence over. That is really important. Very important. Let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit and focus on something really important that Justin, you brought up uh, just a moment ago. High schoolers who are seniors and they've just come to the new reality that they're not going to have the kind of finish to their school, sports, academics, graduation, ceremonies, open houses, things like that. Let's talk about how parents can help their graduating seniors navigate through this very unusual period of history. I think that um, some of the things that I see people doing with birthdays, you know, you have drive-by birthdays, you have, they're trying to recreate some sort, of, some sense of normalcy mm -hmm. um, with these things and replace you know the normal birthday get-together with you know at least being able to see people um, I think that one of the things that hit me out of the statement you said was um, the fact that they're not gonna get it they could not get a graduation party I mean no. you know maybe maybe they can wait until the end of the summer but a lot of them will be hopefully going to college right. at this point right. um, they're gonna miss out on all these just you know coming of age type things um, and I'm myself I'm, I'm hoping to figure out ways yeah. to to help our students, um, you know, recapture some of that. Yeah. So to your point, it's really critical that we acknowledge the loss that we acknowledge, and not just the loss of graduation, but that was a good point you made. The multiple losses that kind of stockpile or fill backfill in to those major um, life transitions. I think the other thing is, and is to ask and not tell. When you're talking to your students, when you're talking to your adolescents, ask them how they're processing it, as opposed to telling them, you know, oh, it's not so bad, you know, college is a real folk. No, 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 no. L ask them how they're processing that. And then it's not a replacement, but to your point, Pastor, look for creative alternatives or creative solutions where you can have some of those markers, you know, and to leverage technology to maybe help bring that about. Mm -hmm. We do tend to be a very resilient culture. We, we tend yeah. to have a lot of attitudes. I've been watching sports, you know, and I see ESPN, uh, lots of commercials, you know, people rallying together. We can do this together. We can get through this. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a whole community of schools that as we go through this, those communities may already be coming together or will continue to come together and make decisions for the culture, right? Mm -hmm. We have to do this together. This is happening to us as a whole. I think if we navigate through this by our support systems, our communities, our, our teachers are for the kids, the principals, the superintendents, yeah. I know they are for the kids. They are. And so we know they're working really hard to make the best of a very difficult situation. The metaphor is I cannot move a grand piano by myself, right? right? And it makes no sense to try. <laughs> that's, that's not gonna end well for my back or the piano. Mm -hmm. And so his perspective as a, as a pastor, uh, clinician's perspective in mental health, uh, business people, we have to lift this thing together. 
And to your point about resiliency and creativity and flexibility and acceptance, those are the kind of dynamics that help us get through something like this. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You said it last week, you said it again today. I think it's a smart statement to make when we're talking to our kids. It's not okay right now, right? Validating yeah. that this is painful, this is difficult, but it will be okay. Giving a sense of uh, a true, genuine hope versus false hope. Speak to that for a moment, the difference between false hope and real hope. False hope is a lot like uh, cotton candy. It tastes really good, but it doesn't have any mm -hmm. nutritional value. And it sets up, it assaults expectations. It creates a set of false or unrealistic or idealistic expectations. That then, you, when that collapses, mm -hmm. somebody's gonna get hurt. Versus real hope. Real hope in faith, in faith in God, or real hope in the partnership and the family and the resiliency of the family. Um, and recognizing that what is happening today is laying the groundwork for the future. Life is about dealing with loss. And when you have real hope, when you have a, a, a hope in, in Christ, when you have a hope in love and, and um, togetherness and these dynamics that are really substantial, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to then gorge on cotton candy. But the problem is, real hope requires a realistic assessment. Yeah. It, it can't pretend that everybody's getting through this alive, because they're not. Right. And so there's a tendency to want to just strongly lean into encouragement or, you know, mm -hmm. just keep feeding this positive, positive thing. Well, I'm not against positivity. And I don't think negativity is the, the order of the day either, but a realistic assessment on what is and what is not, that's grounded in maturity. Yeah. And I would say, you've said this before at the Response Care Center to us as clinicians, um, everything rises and falls on good assessment. Yep. And as emotions go up, assessment ability goes down. Yeah, emotion goes up, assessment goes down. So when, when, when parents, adults, are dealing with their own emotional response to this, and they're feeling that emotional um, overturn, yeah. that's a good time to take a time out. Take a break. That's not the time to probably rationalize with your kids. You no. probably need some self-care. Um, yeah. Go for a walk when it's not snowing. Today it's been snowing. <laughs> um, try to spend some time caring for yourself. And then um, get back to your kids when you're in a better state of mind. Yeah. Give yourself permission to not do so well and then find space to correct your course and come back and spend some quality time with your family and, and make progress. The other thing I would add is because we will get through this together, talk to other parents. If I, if I, have, if I have kids his age, I'm, I'm going to be calling him up as my friend and saying, mm -hmm. what are you doing? What's working? What isn't working? Mm -hmm. right? right? And then you cross-reference that um, that's the that's great, helpful. That's the yeah. greatest asset that we have is partnership with other people who are in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. But again, the partnership and the collaboration requires maturity, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and this isn't a time where egos and pride and mm -hmm. all kinds of other dynamics should be getting in the way. Yeah. We're coming up to the end of our 30 minute um, time together. Are there any last thoughts that either of you would want to include as we finish this very brief conversation? Too big of a topic to spend just 30 minutes on, but any last thoughts? I would say if you're feeling the pressure of um, you know, not having enough space, then designate a place in the house, a basement or a room where people can go mm -hmm. and, or coordinate a schedule so that they can get away. Your, your daughter is an extrovert. Pay attention to the difference between how an extrovert and an introvert would handle this response. Introverts are like, oh, I'm loving the isolation. <laughs> an extrovert is like, what? I'm dying. And so um, be creative about how you meet those needs. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing that I would like to say is this is a grieving situation. 
There are losses that are not real obvious. And so pay attention to the obvious and the not so obvious losses and give space for people to, to deal with that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I think trying to find, continue to find, I know some of your students probably already are, but continuing to find a way to encourage connection with their peers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I got good. a text from one of my, one of the parents of the youth group today saying, hey, you know, thank you so much for continuing awesome. to meet with the kids. They have been looking forward to the Zoom call. They're glad that they yeah. still have that connection. It's uh, it's great. And it's funny, I, before we started this, right before, um, I was scrolling through Facebook and um, I saw a, a short 10 second video of a dad. And he, he st he's in front of the camera and says, parents, if you're if you wake up at 12 in, at night and find your kid talking to their friend on the phone, let them. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> let them. He says they've lost everything. Yep. They've lost all sense of normalcy, uh, yeah. you know, anything. So, you know, let them have those connections. So that's what, that's what I would say. Good, good. That's good. Just remind your teams that everybody um, is working so hard to manage this situation. Um, you're part of that, we're part of that. Um, show your teams, like Rob said, it's possible to continue to do everything that we're doing with a spirit of calmness, right? And then if it's necessary to adjust plans, be transparent and direct with your teams. They can handle direct communication yeah. and the rationale behind any decisions yep. that the family has to make. Make these decisions together as a team. Yep. You're gonna win, uh, we're gonna win, so it's yeah. gonna be okay. Um, let's go ahead and finish and uh, next week we'll be here with uh, Dr. Rob, uh, Vince and Kelly Aldrich and we're going to be talking about marriage specifically for marriage partners and how they're navigating through this so that's what we'll be doing next week. We hope that you guys have a great Easter weekend and yes. God bless.